One of the most wonderful things about being at Stanford is that I work with people at the same level of the organization who are chairs of clinical departments with large scientific commitments. And one of the very finest people I've known here at Stanford is going to speak with you next. He's a doctor doctor. He's a MD, PhD, has been at Stanford for years. Uh, Gary Steinberg is the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery. He led the Clinical Neuroscience Institute that was a precursor to the university-wide Stanford Neuroscience Institute, and he's really a leader among leaders. So I want to welcome my friend Gary to the stage. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Laura, uh, for inviting me. And uh, you and Michael have put on a very impressive program. I have to tell you, I've really enjoyed the last two days. I've learned a lot. Um, and I uh, um, re really think you should continue um, these successful um, programs in the future. I, I think it's great getting this um, uh, collaboration uh, and uh, mix of people together. It's really how I think we're going to develop therapies for the future. So um, we've heard a lot about circuits um, and the importance of understanding circuits and, and manipulating them. And I'm going to continue that theme and show you how we've actually been able to translate that uh, into the clinical arena. Uh, when I was in um, high school, I actually uh, became very interested in the brain and uh, the brain-mind dualism. And when I went to college, uh, I took a bunch of uh, courses in Freudian and Jungian um, psychology and uh, thought about pursuing psychiatry as a career. And then when I came to Stanford as a medical student and graduate student in 1974, I was pretty much set on becoming a neurologist. Um, but at that time, there were actually very few treatments that were available to treat patients with disabling neurologic or psychiatric disorders. Uh, in fact, we, at that time, uh, what is that, 44 years ago I've been at Stanford, uh, we really could only dream about trying to restore function in patients with these disabling uh, disorders, diseases, and illnesses. Um, and that's part of the reason that I went into neurosurgery at that time. The fields have changed very much. Um, and then in 1987, Alim Benabid, uh, a French uh, MD, PhD neurosurgeon, developed a therapy of putting uh, electrodes in the brain through a very tiny hole and stimulating the subthalamic nucleus for patients with Parkinson's who were not responding to medical therapy. And this became a very common treatment. Here's, I'm going to show you an example of a patient of Jamie Henderson's, one of our neurosurgeons. Is my sound working, by the way? Great. I mean, the sound on the, on the videos. Uh, we'll, we'll see if I have to change it. Anyway, here is a guy who has medically intractably Parkinson's. He's on maximal medical therapy. And um, you can imagine how disabling this is. And so Jamie, uh, with the patient awake, put in a tiny electrode, ensured it was in the correct place. And here you're going to see him a few months later. Um, so uh, really a miraculous cure. And that's been uh, extended to patients like this young man who has a gene mutation which causes a dystonia. That's a movement disorder. Again, medicine does not work for this, there, uh, for this disease. And you can imagine what his life was like. Gary Height, who was one of our functional neurosurgeons at the time, put in bilateral electrodes. And here he is uh, also a few months later. So we're learning these circuits that we thought were irreversibly damaged or dead are certainly not. And there are different ways to uh, restore function. Uh, we're using deep brain stimulation now for not just movement disorders and chronic pain, where it, it has a, a long history. But in the past few years, it's been approved for epilepsy, two types of stimulation. And Stanford led uh, both trials. Uh, for uh, brain stimulation of epilepsy. One uses a closed loop system, Neuropace. Uh, we're moving into psychiatric diseases. Makbati uh, is using uh, transmagnetic stimulation, TMS, to treat patients with depression. That's been around for a while, but what's new is we're now treating patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, 
moving into depression, treating them with uh, deep brain stimulation and cyber knife radiosurgery. There's a single trial at the Cleveland Clinic for treating patients with stroke using stimulation of the contralateral dentate nucleus. Uh, we're starting a trial, a multi-center trial we're participating in on Alzheimer's disease with stimulation. And Casey Halperin, one of our very uh, innovative uh, functional neurosurgeons at Stanford, uh, just got funded by the NIH um, for a multi-center trial to stimulate nucleus accumbens for obesity. Very, very innovative. Here's another example where um, actually we were one of the first places in the country to acquire um, a uh, focused ultrasound machine. This is an MRI-directed uh, ultrasound machine uh, where we can uh, 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 focus uh, uh, energy, uh, ultrasound, through the skull uh, into areas of the brain, the thalamus in this instance, to treat essential tremor. And this was part of a study, and you can see... Uh, let's, let's see how the drink can get. Try to, try to drink just a little... This patient has essential tremor which okay. has become right. disabling. <laughs> and here is what he looks like after non-invasively. Let's see how this goes, see if he can drink that. Treat, this is the same day he was treated and put a little lesion in his thalamic, le thalamic <laughs> nucleus. Not bad, huh? Pretty good, huh? Well, you're going to take a wants to keep <laughs> drinking. So we just recruited a year ago a brilliant computational neuroscientist from Germany, Peter Tass, who has developed an even less invasive method of stimulating the brain, and that is using a vibrotactile glove, which vibrates, stimulates the nerves in the hand and fingers, orthograde back to the brain, and it resets circuits that are actually too synchronized. I would have thought in some of these diseases that you want to synchronize the circuits, but that's the problem with Parkinson's and, and many diseases, if, that the circuits are too synchronized. So this impulse desynchronizes them. Here's a patient who's had Parkinson for, uh, since 2007 on multiple medications. This is the way he was preoperatively. And he uses a cane. He's supposed to use a wheelchair. This is one of the first patients that we've treated at Stanford. This patient was treated a, a few weeks ago with this glove stimulation, and here he is after one day of stimulation, non-invasively, and so far it seems to be a lasting result. We're, we're following these patients long-term now, but if that works, it's gonna revolutionize the way we can modulate circuits in a non-invasive method. I want to talk a little bit about uh, brain-computer interface. We heard um, from our expert at, at DARPA um, yesterday about some of the, the, the new, um, really uh, fascinating uh, kinds of um, technology that's being innovated there. Um, this is a method uh, whereby you can bypass the injured nervous system, so it's applicable to patients who are paralyzed below the neck from a uh, spinal cord injury, a stroke, from uh, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And the idea is to place a, uh, an electro, a, a series of electrodes on a small array in the motor and or premotor cortex to take the signals. And when you lift up something or move, the first cells that fire are in those areas. Take those signals, process them on a very sophisticated neural decoder computer, and the output is then electrical, so you can drive a robotic arm or a computer cursor. Here's what the array looks like. It is the size of a baby aspirin. This is the Utah array that has 100 a, a electrodes, and we heard yesterday there are now arrays that have 10,000 electrodes, so think of what we can do in the future. Here is what the signals sound like. That's not running. There you go. And here's the first patient we implanted. She has ALS, she has a tracheostomy, um, and she can't move below the neck. You can see the device here, which is attached uh, to her skull. So it, this is still wired. We heard yesterday about making this wireless, and we're working on that. And she was asked, how do you encourage your sons to practice music? And she's gonna type just by thinking. So here she is responding. So imagine this, just thinking she can move these, the computer cursor and she can interact with the internet, 
And her response is, when they started their lessons, they were almost three, and they took on to playing violin. So she has set the world's record for typing by thinking. Now, it's not a large N of people, of course. But we have the best, we think, the best algorithms. And it really depends on the collaboration between a brilliant engineer, Krishna Shinoy, in, bio, in engineering here, and Jamie Henderson, a neurosurgeon, to develop this kind of technology. Here's another example. This also uses the same technique. This is the BrainGate Utah Array. This was done at Brown University Mass General Hospital. There are a few places in the country that do this. This patient had a stroke 60, excuse me, 16 years ago, has not been able to move below the neck. And here she has learned how to use, uh, how to think and move this computer directed arm, this robotic arm. She hasn't been able to drink from the, a thermos in 16 years. And this is the dispassionate scientist in the background, not supposed to smile. And he can't help himself, and she can't help herself. So you can imagine what this would mean for patients if this becomes a widespread therapy. And a final example uh, of this technology, this was done at the University of Pittsburgh. It uses an electrocorticography grid, so it has laid on the surface, similar technology, but not the Utah Ray. He had a motorcycle accident, paralyzed below the neck. This is the first time he's using this Probably robotic arm. 45 minutes ago. I got to use a robotic arm for the first time, and uh, I got to reach out and touch my for the first time in seven years. reaching out and touching my girlfriend for the first time and holding her, holding her hand. That was, that was my highlight. And we acquired a $100 million Doppler arm. We didn't pay for it, of course, but they loaned us this to, uh, and this articulates in more directions of freedom than your arm or my arm does. And the final thing I want to talk to you about is another way of modulating circuits, which surprised us, and that is using stem cell transplant Currently, there's no treatment to restore function after a stroke. Most patients who have a stroke can recover some over six months. After six months, no, no further recovery. Stem cell transplant is moving quickly into many indications, uh, including uh, myocardial infarction. What about for stroke? We started working on this about 18 years ago in my lab, and we were able to transplant human cells into rodents after the stroke and recover function. And um, it, uh, what we found was that our initial notion that these neural stem cells turn into the, all the cells in the brain and reconstitute circuits, and that's how the animals recover, is simply not true. The way they recover is that these cells secrete very powerful trophic factors, growth factors, molecules, and proteins that enhance native mechanisms of recovery. So in a simple sense, the cells turn the brain from an adult brain into an infant or neonatal brain that can recover very well after a stroke or, or other kinds of injury. And those processes include axonal dendritic sprouting, new blood vessel formation. They have a very profound effect on modulating the immune system, decreasing even chronic inflammation, and enhancing native new formation of uh, new neurons, glia cells, and new synapses. It's called plasticity. So we partnered with SanBio, a local biotech company who had uh, figured out a process uh, to use adult bone marrow derived cells. Two patients were enough, uh, provided enough cells to treat 18 patients. The cells were placed in culture, expanded, cryopreserved, and then shipped to the site. Interestingly, no immunosuppression was used, and that's because these bone marrow-derived cells actually are immunosuppressive in, the, in, in themselves, much as I uh, mentioned about all stem cells. Uh, we treated uh, 18 patients total on a dose escalation paradigm. What we did was to put a stereotactic frame on the patient uh, attached to the skull and scalp. It's like a GPS system, except that we were able to deliver cells with a precision of less than a millimeter where we want. And we transplanted the cells around the subcortical stroke. We decided to treat subcortical, not cortical stroke first. And we placed the cells around the stroke, not in it, because the stroke itself is a very inhospitable um, environment and they don't survive even transiently. 
The patients were 33 to 75 years old, and they were uh, usually years out from a stroke. You knew they weren't going to recover. They uh, were stable, had chronic deficits, and they had severe motor deficits. Uh, we did this with the patients awake through a hole the size of a nickel, small burr hole, and all the patients went home the next day. I treated 12 of the patients at Stanford, six were treated at the University of Pittsburgh. This is what it looks like at surgery. And not only did we find that the therapy was safe and feasible, but we were stunned to see that patients recovered. And you can see here, compared to their neurologic baseline, the patients overall started recovering at one month, increased to three months. It was stable at six months, which was the primary efficacy endpoint, stable at 12 years, and we just had a paper submit, uh, accepted for publication showing that this recovery is still sustained at two years. Three quarters of the patient had recovery which was considered meaningful, and, and that signifies that it changed their life in a beneficial way. Here's an example of a patient. Uh, this is Neil Schwartz um, examining her. She's 71, two years out from her stroke. You turn on the, yeah. So she can only move her, can we have some sound? Here. Can you extend she can only arm? move her thumb. She's paralyzed on the left thumb. side. And can barely get her leg off the One, bed. Can you get it up? Two, three, four, five. Let go. So we transplanted her, and then here she is the next day. This was one of our early Time recoveries. As hard as you can, the arm. To your nose. Oh my goodness. Video that. And touch my hand. One, two, three, four, five. That's great. Okay. That's and here she is at a year. So it doesn't apply only to young patients. 71 year old, she's now walking. Great. She was wheelchair bound. Smile. Here's a second patient. This patient was two years out from her stroke. You knew she's not going to recover. She has uh, a severe motor problem. She can barely move her arm, as you We're can see. Up. She. Um, cannot communicate well. You could not understand her speech because it was a left-sided stroke. And she, uh, her walking was extremely poor. She didn't want to um, get okay. married because she thought she'd be embarrassed walking down the aisle. We transplanted her, and here she is two and a half months later. And here she, <laughs> and here she is four and a half years later. Um, she recently actually gave me a, an award at the Smithsonian Institute. For two years after that, I was unable to say more than 20 words. I couldn't move my right arm more than a few inches and could only walk for five minutes without needing a wheelchair. It's been four and a half years to the day now and I'm able to climb stairs, have conversations with family and friends. I run, I work out. My life is amazing. I was also able to become a mother. So what have we learned? We know that it, this therapy is safe, uh, it's feasible. We don't wanna oversell it. It's still early stages of investigation clinically but we uh, had a um, significant recovery in all of our patients overall. The main thing from my point of view that we learned is that these circuits we thought were dead or, or irreversibly damaged are not. They can be resurrected. We just have to figure out the mechanisms. And um, on the basis of data from uh, preclinical studies in our lab and the patients, we now believe that what's happening is that the secreted factors from these cells are uh, affecting the immune system. They're modulating chronic inflammation and causing uh, an improvement in the excitatory inhibitory balance of the circuits. Uh, and that's why the patients are getting better. In some way, they are derepressing circuits that have, that have been suppressed for many years. This led to a phase two study. We just completed enrollment last December, double-blind randomized study. Uh, and we'll see the results. Uh, we'll start analyzing that in December of this year. And at the same time, in addition to stroke, we treated with Sanbio, the same company, um, 
uh, a, uh, patients with traumatic brain injury, chronic patients, again, and we're going to analyze those results, uh, start analyzing in about a year. Um, we still don't know what the best cell to use is. Should it be embryonic derived? Should it be fetal derived? Should it be adult derived? We developed the cell in my lab, which is an embryonic derived neural stem cell that looks better in terms of efficacy and in terms of manufacturing than these SAM bio cells. And we're planning on, uh, we're hoping to clear an IND with the FDA if we stay on schedule uh, in six months from now, and then we'll start a trial at Stanford. We don't know the best treatment window. These were chronic patients. Should we be treating acutely? subacutely, chronically, and how to deliver the cells. We deliver these intracerebral, which I think is best, at least in the chronic state, but intravenous uh, avenues are being uh, tried now. There are, tri there are trials using intravenous, intraarterial, even intrathecal into the uh, space surrounding the spinal cord. So what I've shown you is that circuits are very, very important. We are now learning how to modulate these, not just in the laboratory, but in the clinical arena, and much of what's happened has been due to the extreme and exceptional advances in our understanding of circuits, of neurobiology, of computer technology, advances in imaging, and particularly advances in device development. So we have these different methods of stimulating. I don't think it matters what kind of uh, energy you use. It could be electrical, it could be magnetic, it can be focused ultrasound, it could be stem cells brain-computer interface, and I think we're going to even be treating patients with optogenetic stimulation light in the near future. So I wanted to thank everyone for your attention. You can see um, it really doesn't matter anymore if you're a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a neurosurgeon, a radiologist, because we're treating the disease, and that's where I think we've, we've come quite a way, and that's what's going to be uh, very important in the future. Thank you very much.